Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Barker, an educator here at the National Museum of the United States Navy. I would like to welcome our guest speakers to start from University of Hawaii, Micah Pollock, and from the Smithsonian, Dr. Carol Happ. To keep from taking too much time, please look into their resumes and you'll see a great number of things these two people have done great in their careers. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Dave, for having us. Um, and thank you to uh, the museum. I do want to acknowledge the troubled history of the Navy on Oahu at this particular moment and call attention to the crisis at Red Hill that um, is currently uh, a part of our lives, our daily lives here. But I'm delighted that your uh, institution is willing to uh, have us to talk about some of the mo more difficult parts of uh America's transnational history um, at this particular moment. Um, I will start with a slideshow uh, presenting some images from Ken Okishi's exhibition, which took place here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in uh, from 2021 in September until April, 2022. <laughs> this was an exhibition we had up during COVID. Um, and I also want to uh, start by pointing out that we had an exhibition concurrent to Ken's show at the John Young Museum uh, that I organized around Dorothea Lang's photographs of Japanese American internment from 1942. And the two exhibitions uh, were meant to show different approaches to looking at um, essentially what was a, a similar moment in history, which is um, just after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, um, there was an executive order that authorized the mass removal of Japanese Americans um, on the West Coast and 120,000 Japanese Americans, uh, the majority of them with US citizenship were taken from their homes and places of work and placed in concentration camps for the rest of the war. So her photographs, uh, in a photojournalistic way in the tradition of great American documentary photographers like Jacob Reese or Lewis Hine capture with great lucidity this particular historical moment. And um, here in Hawaii, uh, we also had detention camps. We had one on Sand Island just off of our island of Oahu where 1,875 Japanese men and women uh, from here in Hawaii were shipped. Um, and then uh, later they those uh, detainees were relocated to mainland camps, including those in California, Wisconsin, Tennessee, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Montana, New Mexico, Texas, Arkansas, and Utah. And an additional about 1,500 were held in camps in the state, um, mainly on Sand Island. Uh, and we do have an extraordinary exhibition that's part of the um, the permanent uh, exhibitions at our Japanese uh, Cultural Center here in Honolulu that features um, many items from people who were uh, detained on Sand Island. Uh, letters, handkerchiefs, small carvings. Um, so this is a history that that we know um, to a certain extent that can be um, taught in history books and that uh, is made visible through certain kinds of uh, record keeping and documentation. And so Ken show, uh, which we asked him to do concurrent to the Dorothea Lang show, really explores a different kind of history. It, it approaches history through the lens of oral history and family history. And it brings uh, an intimacy um, and a complexity to official narratives about war and detention. Um, it's centered around this image, um, which is labeled Ted's first birthday, and which is a, a family picture that Ken, uh, Ken Okishi's family had. Uh, and it shows um, his grandfather, against a backdrop of dolls uh, that are traditional Japanese boys' day dolls um, of the sort that you might have in, I, I've actually never seen one this elaborate myself, but you might have a few of these dolls in your home. And um, they, this image stood out to Ken 
who grew up on the mainland because um not just because it was taken in Hawaii, but because he had never seen these dolls. They were no longer a part of his family uh, history, a part of his family life. And actually these and other family possessions from Japan were thrown into uh, Mamala Bay by the artist's uh, grandfather, who as a young um, man uh, following the bombing of his workplace, because he worked at Pearl Harbor as a welder, was convinced that these objects and others like him would identify him as Japanese and consequently cause him to be shipped off to a concentration camp. So this Ken's exhibition centers around the lost objects in his family history, and takes an inventory of the psychological generational impact of these missing objects of um, and how they how the absence of certain things contributed to identity formation. Um, so we have family history here in a way that's very and the, a use of photography that's very unlike Dorothea Lang's use of photography. Lang's photos were taken as commissions by the American government who were documenting um, the removal of Japanese American citizens. Ken's photographs were almost, uh, can be seen as almost a, a suppressed narrative around the war um, and one in which, um, one which is not part of an official record. And I think his show um, deeply explores the idea of generational trauma and what happens when we don't talk about history or when there's a certain element to history that's suppressed. Um, so it kind of traces Ken's maternal grandfather and his history and kind of the trauma of that history. But in other ways, I also saw the show as a kind of, um, and Ken might object to this, but a kind of site-specific performance that needed to come here to Honolulu to be complete because the story of his family, they're Japanese immigrants who settled here um, in in our town, in our, in our city, uh, around Diamond Head and Kaimuki. And so even though parts of the show had taken formation in 2018, um, he had shown, I'll show you some of the elements of this, but his uh, childhood possessions at a gallery called Rena Spallings in LA in 2018. Um, and then a portion of the video that we showed here was shown as part of Manifesta in Marseille in 2020, it was important to me that we bring the exhibition here and kind of flesh it out um, and bring all the elements together because the story was really about this family that um, was originally from Japan, had settled in Honolulu, and also kind of what happens when when objects make a return, when the repressed makes a return, when things that we're trying to forget um, not just we as individuals, but maybe we as families and our narratives about ourselves as Americans are trying to forget, make a return. Um, and so one of the main elements of the show, and these are some installation images, uh, is what's at the center here. There, it's a show with multi parts. So this is actually the same gallery that you can see behind me. Um, and there's a video installation here. There's a slideshow behind this wall. There's a video around the corner. Um, there's a banner here that I'll talk about later. And the thing I wanted to start with are these objects on the floor because they kind of kick off the journey. Um, and I highlighted in yellow the parts that of the show that we're talking about at any particular time. Uh, the show featured a carload of personal effects transported from the Okishi family basement in Ames, Iowa, which is where um, Ken grew up. So these are his childhood things. You can see his name on them. And when you walked into the gallery, they were kind of the first thing you were confronted with as a viewer, um, placed sculpturally on the floor. Sometimes I think they ha they gave the impression that we hadn't finished installing the show yet. They felt provisional, but actually their placement was very deliberate in that the video that was projected across them kind of raked across some of the surfaces of the boxes to create these shadows. So you were constantly reminded of their presence and also they were placed in such a way that you had to navigate your way through them, but there were paths that you could find um, to get through these these personal objects. Um, and they had been things that Ken had, um, that his family had stored for him it, meticulously in archive plastic storage bins and cardboard boxes um, that were a portion of his childhood. Um, 
And as part of the video that you see here, and also as part of the slideshow that's behind the video wall, you see Ken um, in in photographs and as someone who's holding the camera, not, not his, his face, but as a, um, a filmmaker, picking up these objects from the basement of his childhood home in Iowa and packing them away in a mini, a rented minivan. And you can see um, they're very quotidian objects. They're the kinds of things that many American children would have had who grew up in the 1970s and 80s, trophies and awards for taking piano lessons, uh, winning different kinds of prizes in um, in piano recitals, some art books, um, some Halloween costumes, magic tricks. Uh, you can see the rabbit in the hat here. I'm trying to remember what else. Um, but everything, I mean, I guess you could you could say this is a happy childhood. You could say from these objects that these this is someone who had it. I think the main word that struck most of us was normal, just a very normal childhood in Ames, Iowa, and a very American childhood. There weren't a lot of things that particularly marked um, this childhood as as Japanese American. Um, there are one or two books that pointed towards him becoming an artist or being interested in art later on, but even the art itself, the kinds of art, um, playing German composers like Bach at piano recitals, studying uh, oil on canvas painting. Um, these all point towards certain kinds of Western culture and European culture that he had um, learned in high school and obviously excelled at. And then uh, we know from his biography, he went on to study at Cooper Union, which is an art school in New York. Um, there are a couple of things from this that kind of pointed in that direction too. There was a, a so these are things that Ken packed up in his car in 2018 and drove across the country. And so part of the slideshow that goes on uh, both in the video and then as a as a slideshow on the other side of the wall shows a, a kind of a classic American road trip that he's taking alone with the objects, um, the childhood objects that he packs up from his family for home. And he does this in 2018. So he's grown. Um, maybe even of an age where his parents would say, you know, we don't really need all of your childhood things in the house. Maybe it's time for you to relocate these objects or, um, and, and something else people commented on, I'm sorry to kind of go into um, ridiculous detail about this, but when looking at his childhood objects, people often said, noted how well cared for they were, how meticulously his parents um, or someone had packed them up and kept them, how they they had, didn't have dust or stains, everything seemed clean, everything seemed stored away um, and, and really, you know, saved and maintained and um, treasured. And so that was also something striking here. You see the minivan uh, packed full of the childhood things um, at a stop on the way. And one of the things that um, that happens during this road trip, which is kind of a classic American, I kept on thinking of Robert Frank and the Americans road trip in terms of the, the still images that he took of it, um, was that he stops at the site of uh, really the ruins of the Topaz War Relocation Center, which was one of these um, concentration camps for Japanese American citizens during World War II um, that is located in Delta, Utah, which is on his way uh, during this drive. Um, and so he there's a small museum there um and some of the images from the slideshow show ken visiting this museum so here's an image that says is mr mochida smiling think about how you respond when someone aims a camera at you photographs may not tell the whole story this is one of ken's images from the from the slideshow if an order went up tomorrow telling you to report to a detention center, what would you do? What if the order only applied to people you don't know? Heads of families register in San Francisco. Oh, and I think that's one of the, the photo relating to one of the photographs below that caption. Uh, and Ken said of this, um, I was visiting the site that was held over uh, my father's generation, held over as in held as a threat. Children at the time, carried through into adult subject formation as the threat of non-compliance to strict and narrow parameters of being a good American 
in the most violent form of that idea. Going to Topaz was, in a way, puncturing the fiction of power in the very political moment when its real possibility of reinvigorated methods was becoming all too real and that inescapable sense of knowing but unable to do anything other than witness and survive. And I think in that sense, he's talking about the moment of 2018 um, and I think also thinking about migrants and detention centers and other things that were happening under the, the Trump presidency, I believe, at that time. Uh, witnessing the ruins and fragments of the camp appearing in front of me suddenly out of a barren landscape is like the way you breathe out suddenly when hit with a difficult subject stream of thoughts. The usual questions that so many ask about who is in or not the camps, uh, who, uh, uh, while obviously significant in my experience, can also mask an important issue that everyone suffers from this history that has never properly been worked through, and it continues to be played out on the faces and the bodies of all Asian Americans up to and including the present. So I think Ken's point here is, um, and something that people did ask during the exhibition, uh, the point is not whether or not your family was in the camp or whether or not your father was interned or his father or your aunts and uncles. The point is that the idea of the camp hung over people um, of this time, Asians of this time, Asian people living in, in the United States as a threat. And it shaped people's um, narratives about themselves. It shaped uh, how they performed Americanness. And for to Ken's mind, this has a lasting impact on him today. So you might think again of um, this idea of the Boys' Day dolls. Uh, and their absence from his childhood and their absence from the family objects that are that were so carefully kept and stored in the Okishi household um, and the way in which um, that suppression of a certain portion of a family legacy becomes a part of the story, becomes a part of a history that is kind of never dealt with um, in all the time. So this is an installation image actually of me sitting and looking at the slideshow. So this is kind of on the other side of that wall. And you can see here this um, banner again. Um, and the slideshow was long and it took you through this road trip in, in a um, with no sound and in a kind of meditative way um, that took you from packing up the objects from the family home into the minivan driving along the highway across the beautiful American landscape um, into this experience of Topaz and the detention center um, and then a few hotels and back on the road um, and sort of uh, looming over it all is this banner which I'll talk about in a moment. There's also a video that was described as a family history made for insurance purposes and it was playing on the wall an another area of the gallery behind a wall um just on a very small monitor and it shows the artist's mother with a handheld video camera documenting every object in the okishi household circa 2009 and so you see her actually you see his father um opening and closing drawers going through um, all of their dishes and turning them over to show the, the video camera, the make of different dishes. You show them going, it shows them going through closets. It shows them going into that basement where everything is stored and kept. And um, you see all of their Christmas tree ornament it showed how meticulous these people were in documenting and taking care of their household items. Um, I have to say everything was beautifully kept. Ken mentioned that um, his mother's family uh, is Mormon and that this is <laughs> that maybe part of the, the storing and packing and, and keeping everything arranged ethos um, comes from that side of the family but it was a it was a utilitarian non-art video that showed you the entire contents of their home um, and and was beautiful I mean they had nothing to be ashamed of every drawer could be opened every closet could be inventoried with the video camera um, but the longer you watched it and it was kind of a long video um, the more at least I got the sense that actually the person who makes the video 
is aware that at any time something horrible could happen, that the only reason you would make such a thorough video for insurance purposes is because you're anticipating a, a fire or a terrible disaster or an earthquake or, you know, it, it's essentially something that you'll need to show documentation that you used to own things in case something terribly wrong happens and you lose everything. And so even though everything looks orderly and well cared for and um, and they seem to be living a very comfortable um, middle class life in Iowa, I think in some ways this video also demonstrates a kind of generational trauma in which just the generation before and and maybe during his childhood, um, Ken Okishi's father was growing up with the sense that everything could be taken away at any time, that suddenly you could be dispossessed of all of your possessions, all of your everything in your home that you could be given a few days notice to have to leave and whatever you couldn't take with you would be um, would be lost to your family forever. There's a real feeling of pending disaster uh, in the video, maybe emphasized by putting it on view in an art exhibition that turned this very quotidian object um, and the sort of fastidiousness with which it's executed into something uh, truly haunting um, that spoke to the generational trauma um, that his family experienced. And there were these small elements throughout the exhibition as well that um, came from the objects from the family inventory, uh, from Ken's childhood inventory. So some of the objects he remade with a 3D scanner and this kind of ghostly doubling of the things that were on the floor of the gallery. So this is a set of um, angel wings that came from a Christmas ornament. Um, in another part of the exhibition, you can see a choir boy from a Christmas ornament kind of um, coming out, emerging from the wall. So there are these kind of ghostly touches throughout. And then, oh, this is, so this is the Christmas ornament choir boy. Um, and then this is the ghostly 3D remade scan of the choir boy coming out of the room. A number of viewers commented that while probably not meant to look Asian, it seemed obvious that perhaps the family had chosen to purchase this particular Christmas ornament because the boy with his um, light complexion and dark hair looked kind of Asian. And so maybe was a kind of um, the Christmas ornament that, who, that looked most like the family purchasing it in this particular case. Um, so these are the objects in the room. There were also some of the artworks that Ken made as a child up through the galleries. Um, and these had all been, again, meticulously preserved and saved by his parents, just as they kept their home when he was growing up in Iowa and even to this day. And just to, like they kept all of his childhood possessions, including every stuffed animal and every piano recital program and every um, even... Uh, this is an image of the video and the video itself also had uh, a, a, a forensic scan animation of the basement of the Okishi family home set in a desert landscape, which documented the basement archive of the family before the removal of the section dedicated to Ken's childhood. So it went from sort of live video of moving the boxes to this kind of, um, it's a program that police can use to recreate uh, sites um, to this forensic scan based on photographs that created a 3D model that the, which was quite low on the floor so that certain silhouettes and objects uh, were silhouetted through the projection and the projection also flickered across some of the, the boxes from his childhood. And then here, Oh, sorry, this is part of the video um, that shows the um, the data point cloud generated 3D scan, this forensic uh, reconstruction of the basement um, in which some of the objects that we recognize around us in the exhibition space are placed. And then here is the, the banner that's kind of lurking in the background. It's a vinyl print. We had it made from his family photograph. Um, we produced it here in Honolulu, and this kind of lurks in the background of the exhibition. It wasn't brightly lit, but it was enormous, and it um, kind of loomed behind the video and the slideshow and over all of these uh, childhood objects, and it's this, this lost portion of the history. So even as we're looking at 
and kind of noticing how completely and meticulously the Okishi family has kept every scrap of Ken's childhood and uh, relationship to loss, and in particular loss of the the very objects in history um, that we can imagine they would have kept, that we can imagine that these people who are so meticulous and so interested in record keeping would have kept and cherished and enjoyed this entire portion of the family, all of these objects are gone. These were the things that were thrown into the uh, into the bay outside of Honolulu in order to prove that uh, the family wasn't Japanese. And so this is kind of uh, suppression. This is the banner of the photograph of the Boys Day Memento um, with 50 Japanese dolls uh, that were thrown into the ocean with the threat of internment. And it kind of haunts this inventory of all of these totally mundane things. And um, I thought it was a kind of extraordinary story that the family had gone to this length to do this, had had thrown the dolls in the ocean, had destroyed any relationship to Japan. But people who came into the exhibition from the Honolulu community, a Japanese American family said, oh yeah, my family also lived in Kaimuki, which was the neighborhood where Ken's family lived. And this is what I remember. They told me about that time the smell of family records and photos being burned hung over the valleys at night. That was part of the experience of, of the fear of internment, of the threat of internment. So even though relatively few families in Honolulu and in Hawaii were interned compared to what happened on the mainland, the, the fear of internment was enough to create the internalization of the expectation that um, Japanese-ness and any sign of Japanese-ness and any relationship to Japan needed to be suppressed and destroyed and then forgotten. And then there were not discussed. So there was no memory of it. But families have things like, um, they brought things like family records over from Japan when they um, Immigrated Hawaii is a place where a number of uh, different diasporic Asian families first uh, had contact with uh, with the United States. This was, of course, before uh, Hawaii was a state. This is when Hawaii was a territory. Um, but these, it, the Japanese community remembers this this moment so well that people who came to the exhibition could remember the smell of the mass destruction of objects from home, um, and so. I think it it for me it was a very powerful exhibition because of the impact of the amount of relatively inane, inane things that Ken's family had kept for him that had made up his own childhood and then the sort of specter of this loss that had taken place and the way in which Ken was trying to confront it or make sense of it but the the photograph um of the boys day dolls hung there like a kind of a um almost like a photograph that you'd come across in a family file and just have no context for, no place for, because it's so foreign to you and your experience of your family and your life. And you could see in the meticulous inventory from 2008 of the Iowa home in Ken's own childhood, there weren't a lot of things uh, that connected this family with Japan. He'd had, um, as he called the show, a model childhood, which was in a way a very American childhood and a very um, European culture influenced childhood uh, without a lot of discussion or examination of, of where his family had come from and also what they had chosen to forget. As Ken Akishi says about this work, everyone suffers from this history that has never been properly worked through and it continues to be played out on the faces and bodies of all Asian Americans up to and including in the present. Visiting the site that was held over my father's generation who were children at the time, carried through into adult subject formation as the threat of non-compliance to strict and narrow parameters of being a good American was the most violent form of that idea, puncturing the punctured the fiction of power in the political moment when its real possibility of reinvigorated methods was becoming all too real and that inescapable sense of knowing but unable to do anything other than witness and survive. And uh, we published a book in collaboration uh, 
with the exhibition uh, with an essay by Nagar Azimi, who's the editor in chief of Badoon magazine. And she says of the work, uh, Kenneth O's grandfather, a welder at Pearl Harbor at the time of the attack, scrambled to dump all traces of Japan in his possession into the ocean. Among the items he chucked were a series of 40 traditional porcelain warrior dolls given to his only child on his first birthday. His son, Kenneth O's father, who had grew up to be an engineer because his welder father said that all the fancy bosses and fancy cars were engineers, learned to enjoy screaming, kill the dirty Japs at newsreels before the movies, and would go on to become a proud member of the Mickey Mouse Club. Call it patriotic camouflage. In the 1950s, he would convert to Mormonism under the care of a Boy Scout leader. An aunt was interned, but never spoke of it. A great uncle, they dismissively called him Pumpkinhead, was also moved away. Mental illness plagued the family for years, and eerie silence reigned. This is a story pockmarked with difficult secrets. And that's kind of the end of my presentation. I just also wanted to point out that we kept all of the boxes that um, his the parts of the show were stored in and put them on display as part of the exhibition itself as well. Thank you. Gosh, I do wish that ethos of meticulous order was something that infused my life too. Um, it's pretty amazing, actually. Um, I'm going to... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, David, and the National Museum of the US Navy for inviting me to join you this afternoon. And um, hearty congratulations to Micah on the sex, uh, successful exhibition of uh, Ken Okishi's A Model Childhood. Certainly uh, in the last uh, couple of years, mounting a multi-part installation has its share of challenges. So again, um, congratulations. Um, so in thinking about Okishi's work and really how I, from within the National Museum of Asian Art, could participate meaningfully in this conversation, uh, I looked into our collections uh, to consider some points of intersection or perhaps better stated of resonance. Um, so I'd like to begin perhaps with just a brief bit of background and institutional context for those who may not be familiar with the museum. And this perhaps um, sets the ground plane a little bit for my slightly more attenuated sort of discussion of works um, um, related to the Japanese uh, North American experience. Established with the 1906 uh, gift of Charles Lang Freer to the United States, the museum today holds the nation's uh, collections of nearly 50,000 objects dating from the Neolithic period to the 21st century. Uh, these holdings originate from uh, ancient China and the ancient Near East, from Japan, Korea, South and Southeast Asia, and the Islamic world, as well as uh, include an important collection of American art of the late 19th century aesthetic movement. Since the 1990s, the Contemporary Asian Art Program has been collecting and exhibiting works in a range of media that broaden our understanding of the changing artistic and cultural landscape of Asia. One particular area of focus has been the transformative role of photography on artistic practice. In 2018, the museum acquired the Gloria Katz and Willard Height collection of Japanese photography, which comprises over 400 photographs dating from the 1880s to 2015. In addition to the large body of visual materials in our archives, the museum traces the development of Japanese photography from early commercial studios to surrealist experimentation, um, from studies of folk customs along the rural backbone of the country to trenchant views of post-war and contemporary society. Also notable is the substantial representation of important Japanese women photographers. Of this latter group, I will discuss briefly two photographic series by Otsuka Chino titled um, Tokyo 434506 and Arrival. Through her works and her more diasporic perspective, I hope to touch on some themes and ideas related to Okishi's installation uh, and perhaps as well um, reach a bit further back into the history of Japanese North American experience. Born in Tokyo, Otsuka moved to the United Kingdom at the age of 10 to attend a boarding school along the North Sea coast. She continued her studies in photography at the University of Westminster and received her master's at the Royal College of Arts. Relocating and um, 
really adjusting, uh, learning a new culture and language at such a young age informs much of her practice. Often driven by the urge to connect, to enact a sort of dialogue with the people and places of her past, her images tend to incorporate portraits of herself or other women in her family, particularly her mother or uh, her um, late grandmother. Ultimately, her personal experience of migration imbues her photographs with a sense of a kind of wrestling with presence, of absence, uh, of, di of displacement, and um, a kind of search for belonging. Tokyo 434506 is emblematic of Otsuka's fascination with traveling through time and interacting with the distant past. For this series, she returned to her childhood home, an apartment in a suburb of Tokyo. Restaging her memories in its bare rooms, she created playful yet um, somewhat disquieting self-portraits. The resulting group of eight diptychs juxtaposes views of the apartment with enigmatic poses in its empty spaces. And here are a few of them. And as you look at these images, you'll see that there's a seam like right in the middle and she abuts two images at different uh, points in time, but in the same space uh, against each other. Fragments of Otsuka's body peek out of the interstices of well-worn surfaces, as if she is trying to relive a game of hide-and-seek. Daylight and shadows catch the deserted corners. The slowed-down process, perhaps, of using a medium-format camera and film in this series seems to further accentuate this feeling of, uh, of a kind of stillness and loneliness, in fact. In this pair of prints, a shot of an open doorway is repeated, slightly enlarged with a floral curtain drawn in front of her silhouetted figure, with only her feet visible. Set amidst the almost blinding contrast of daylight in the darkened doorway, her spectral and partially obscured body evoke the elusiveness of memory sort of ill-fitting um, abandoned spaces uh, in a way make palpable this impossibility of ever returning home, of ever going back as it were. Drawing from her own experience and um, also a, a kind of perceived lacuna in, in knowledge of Japanese migration in official archives in different countries, uh, Otsuka has created works based on research that she conducted, for instance, at the British Library or uh, in the Netherlands on uh, Japanese students during the 19th century. And also in this interesting series, um, uh, this is some of the research material, but she also uh, looked at images of picture brides at the Nikkei National Museum in Canada. In 2014, Otsuka was invited for a residency at this museum in British Columbia, where she became, as she put it, mesmerized by a small group of picture bride photographs in the museum's archives. Not many such photos in private hands survived the forced relocation and imprisonment during World War II, so she focused on four of them. This led to further research on the history of Japanese immigrants in Canada and the oral and visual documentation that had been gathered, particularly in the fascinating study and firsthand accounts collected by Miyoko Kudo um, those accounts were first published in Japanese in 1983, and it was only until um, 2020 or 2021 that they were published in translation in English. Uh, these images are just some examples that were extracted from that volume. Um, simply put, uh, the process was that a Japanese immigrant in North America would send his photograph to a matchmaker requesting a bride. After a successful exchange of photos, both parties agreed to uh, marriage and the bride in Japan would enter her name in the family register of the groom in an immigration visa, she would board a ship to North America. As in the US, um, picture marriage was promoted initially as a useful tool for creating more model communities, uh, um, for um, instituting a kind of moral reform of, of the communities which were predominantly male. Uh, the peak period of picture marriage in North America was between 1908 and 1920. Um, I believe some estimates put it at about 10,000 brides that came to the United States and um, somewhere between four to 6,000 that came to Canada. 
It was a relatively brief period and would not constitute a majority of the Japanese immigrant population. However, the picture brides, and especially their images, like the ones you see here, um, became uh, instrumentalized by governments and the media in an atmosphere of growing anti-Japanese propaganda. So, you know, what we see here would be um, sort of classic examples of photographs that would have been exchanged. Um, for the woman, she would have gone to a studio, which is, has this sort of interesting history that then is intertwined with the way photography developed in Meiji era Japan, but also changes in marriage rights, um, um, sort of marriage traditions. And uh, the photograph of, um, of the uh, potential groom uh, in North America and of course, they're they're idealized. It's a it's a self fashioning and a self presentation. But what's also interesting um, is uh, in looking through a number of studies that consider how the images that were a kind of self fashioning for marriage were also repurposed into identity photographs, passport photographs. They were copies were attached, or the the one copy that um, she might have traveled with was then attached to. Uh, their immigration files in order to keep track of them, in order to um, serve more um, surveillance means. Um, you also see on the bottom corner um, at one of uh, numerous examples of picture brides that were photographed arriving um, uh, in groups coming on boats. And, you know, um, in the early phases, perhaps, that was perhaps seen as a more celebratory moment, um, full of anticipation and anxiety. But later, <clears throat> particularly in US media, um, you see that these photographs were then um, re-instrumentalized as a kind of, um, and, and sort of framed uh, with a language that uh, veered more towards a sense of invasion or a contamination. So these photographs themselves um, have a particularly interesting uh, multivalent history that through Otsuko's project, you start to think about and, and start to access. Um, but focusing back on the Japanese Canadian um, um, context, um, a little more background by 1941, um, those uh, Japanese Canadian communities were located again, mostly along the coast of British Columbia. Um, Many of them worked as fishermen, as miners, uh, and foresters. But again, as I mentioned, they were increasingly being perceived as an economic and social threat. Measures against Japanese Canadians during World War II were equally harsh. They also were subject to exclusion orders. Uh, they were moved initially to, um, by some accounts, livestock barns in Vancouver. Families were separated in their cases. Men were um, usually assigned to road, road building crews, um, farms, uh, prison camps, while the women and children were moved to the interior um, to so-called ghost towns or towns that were mostly uninhabited, um, had very few services, if any. After the war, Canada even attempted to relocate several thousand back to Japan. While some studies on the impact of these policies and anti-racist calls to action were produced in the 1950s and 60s, um, as uh, noted historian uh, Karen Inouye points out, quote, the lingering effects of wartime incarceration, its afterlife, tended to defy expression for a very long time. The double invisibility of the photographic subjects as Japanese immigrants and as women drew Otsuka to that handful of portraits taken nearly a century ago. Recognizing them as pioneers and also um, attempting to reimagine the sense of anticipation that the sitters might have felt, um, Otsuka seeks to, uh, through some formal strategies, restore a sense of presence and connection uh, to their histories um, using imagery, scale, and sound. Um, as coming out of her research uh, in Canada, she reshot the four portraits that she found there and she created diptychs like the one you see on the screen. Um, she also uh, created an installation um, that projected these diptychs 
And the projections were accompanied by the voices of young women recounting the experience of departure, anticipation, and arrival um, in, in essence and in a very simple way, bringing these subjects to life. Here in these examples, the portrait is brought into a more universal and familiar space through juxtaposition, coupled with expansive or horizonless landscape views or tight in shots. Um, she creates a kind of uh, gentle tension between the specificity of the portraits and the textures and contrasts of um, these almost fathomless spaces. In doing so, each portrait is, in a sense, sort of freed from particular historical and archival context and transformed into a kind of um, multi-layered representation where you have the named sitter uh, in each of these four cases, um, Otsuka's own uh, dialogue with the past. She's, she's coming from her own sense of um, her own position in diaspora to look at um, uh, other aspects of Japanese history outside of Japan, um, and also a kind of um, embodiment of the imagined feelings that she projects onto uh, these portraits that she discovers. The um, format of the photographs and the larger installation, There we go, that's an image of the installation as it was shown at the uh, Nikkei National Museum. Um, uh, the, the format of the photographs and the larger installation also, I would suggest, point to that contentious history of these um, objects, uh, of these photographs as objects. Um, so just sort of reiterating what I mentioned um, um, just a few moments ago, these uh, photographs played a particular role in both um, a kind of self-identification, but also have a, a more complicated legacy as those photographs moved across, literally across the ocean. Um, and as they began sort of circulating um, as a form of identity, as a form, uh, as, an op as opportunities for a kind of scrutiny um, to support or illustrate uh, more negative tropes of uh, these women, uh, of these um, female immigrants, um, um, they were frequently kind of re-signified, if you will, in um, as the narrative around these immigrant communities changed. Um, so in different ways, and for better or for worse, these simple portraits um, were intertwined in histories in in in, in so social and photographic histories in Japan, and also moved through um, different um, histories and narratives in the um, in North America, in the United States, and also in Canada. Um, so these diptychs, these very sort of straightforward diptychs, um, and their installation format really do call to mind the inherent fluidity of uh, the portrait photograph and how easily that they can be resignified. What she does um, um, through these juxtapositions is to, um, in a way, reclaim them, reclaim them, perhaps um, turn this kind of uh, objectifying function around um, to give them monumentality and scale to, um, re to layer in, um, imagine, uh, voices that are drawn from actual narratives that have been collected. Um, and on the one hand, pointing to um, the slightly lesser known history, particularly in Canada, of um, early Japanese immigration, um, but also to move this history into a space that has a, a, that kind of affective power where the archives can draw and engage the viewer into uh, these histories on a very intimate and individual level, but also point them to thinking about these larger social histories. The notion of the personal journey and diasporic perspective, the mundane and intimate objects and places that, again, point us to those larger social histories, 
as well as the role of photography in particular in prompting a re-examination of that past. These are just some of the resonances that struck me as I thought about a model childhood. Thank you. So it, this notion of the personal journey, that diasporic perspective, um, uh, the way that mundane and intimate objects and places can, again, point us to the larger social histories, and also particularly the role of photography in prompting this re-examination of the past. These are, again, just some of the resonances that struck me as I thought about uh, a model childhood, but from a slightly different perspective. Um...